Good evening and a very warm welcome on behalf of Milim to this evening's presentation. Welcome to you wherever you are in the UK and indeed wherever you are in the world. Our series of online talks and conversations continues with our guest Jonathan Stone and I'll introduce Jonathan in just a moment. Uh, just some housekeeping first, please do ask questions. This is possible by typing whatever you'd like to ask into the Q&A facility on your screen. We will do our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. And let me also draw your attention to the chat facility, which will allow you to send a message to all of the other participants on this webinar, should you wish to do so. And finally, this event is being recorded and will appear in the next day or so on the Millim website at millim.org.uk. You can find recordings of other past events there, as well as details of our future programme for which you can book tickets. And so to our guest today, Jonathan Stone is a graduate of Yale and a former creative director of a New York advertising agency. He has published 10 novels, including the bestseller Moving Day. Several of his books have been optioned for film. Jonathan's short stories have appeared in numerous publications. His most recent book is this one, The Prison Minion, and this is the work we'll be discussing this evening. He joins us from New Canaan, Connecticut. Jonathan, a very warm million welcome to you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Uh, looking forward to it. Now, um, I would imagine most of our viewers haven't read uh, the book. So for the benefit of those who haven't, in a nutshell, what's the book about? Uh, I, um, uh, I was reading the New York Times one morning about uh, two years ago, uh, and I came across uh, an article that described uh, a, um, a federal prison in the, the uh, um, American federal system uh, called Otisville, and this prison caters exclusively to Jewish prisoners. When I read that little detail, I practically fell out of my chair. I couldn't believe that there was such a prison. Uh, and it's the, uh, it kind of came into uh, public consciousness when Michael Cohen, uh, Trump's uh, um, kind of fixer, uh, was sentenced and asked to go to Otisville. Um, and uh, uh, I learned a little more about this prison where there's a uh, uh, kosher kitchen, where there are minion services, uh, where, there's, uh, where there are Shabbat services. And uh, I felt like, gee, I can't, A, I can't believe there's, there's a, a prison like this. And B, this is, this is a novel waiting to be written. C, I'm a novelist. Why don't I write the novel? So that's really, uh, that's, that's uh, the derivation of the, of the novel. Um, and it really comes out of my uh, surprise that such a place actually exists. Well, you've surprised me too, and I've read the book. Um, how, how, how big is this place? So uh, Otisville is, um, it's about uh, 200 to 250 prisoners. It's, um, it's a minimum security prison, as you might imagine. It is attached to a medium security facility in the same in the same area, uh, but the you know the Otisville prison is uh, it's all white collar crime, uh, it's all white collar uh, white collar criminals uh, with sentences of um, ten years or less. Uh, so it is not. I mean, for instance, Bernie Madoff, who you may uh, you know you may remember, he he ran a Ponzi scheme in America that built, uh, you know, billions. Uh, he was not allowed to go to Otisville, although he requested it because he received a 30 year sentence. This is all uh, nonviolent offenders. And that also appealed to me that, uh, um, you know, people are in for, for financial crimes, uh, for scams. Um, and I thought, eh, this is, there's, there's a good novel lurking here. Well, you've, you've certainly written a good novel, but if I'm not mistaken, your, your earlier books are classed as mystery and suspense. This is more of a comic novel. There, there are suspense elements in it, but was there something particular that made you want to change the genre? And is the process of writing a comic novel different to writing a, a suspense novel? Well, I mean, you know, it's a very, um, you're absolutely right. 
that this was indeed my first comic novel and that my previous nine novels are all uh, kind of classic mystery thriller suspense. They're very much uh, in that genre. Um, and really what happened was uh, I read that New York Times article, uh, which by the way, I thought was so important uh, that you notice, um, Jonathan, that it begins, uh, it opens the book, that actual article, uh, pretty much word for word. Um, and uh, I can tell you that as far as what's different about it, well, you know, this thing, as you may have already been able to tell, this was a lot more fun to write. This was kind of, I was, I was writing this not for a mystery thriller audience. This was really written for myself, written for my, my own amusement, written so that, um, so that, you know, I would feel and I would judge whether it worked or didn't work. Uh, I could take it in any direction I wanted. Uh, and that was really, you know, it was kind of liberating to write a comic novel and something very different from what I've spent my literary career doing. Now you, um, you had a day job, I believe you're, you're retired now. Um, and, and am I right in thinking you used to, you used to write your novels uh, as you were traveling uh, to and from work? Uh, th that is uh, entirely correct. I, um, uh, I was uh, commuting to, from my home in Connecticut, which is about 40 miles from Manhattan, commuting by train uh, to Midtown Manhattan to my advertising job. And it was a stage of life when I had two little toddlers at home and I really needed to be, you know, attentive to them and, and helpful at home. And it was a, you know, a high stress New York advertising job uh, that took all my time and energy at work. So I did have uh, these two hours a day one hour going in on the train, one hour coming out. And when I began, it was really before cell phones, laptops were fairly new, uh, the train was quiet. I had really two hours to myself uh, and you couldn't even, it was a time when you couldn't even communicate with the office. So in these two hours, uh, I began a routine of, of writing on the train. Uh, and even, even the commuters around me, would, they could see what I was doing and they were quiet. Uh, and I, I, I've been teased a couple of times about my thrillers because people have said to me, gee, John, when I get to the end of a chapter, I feel, I can feel the train pulling into Grand Central Station. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I was really kind of writing to some degree around the rhythm of the commute. And the train presumably stopped there and didn't go any further. Because I, I'd be worried <laughs> right. you'd miss your stop. Well, if it, if it had gone further, that would have been a novel in itself. Sure, sure. I find this very interesting. Um, obviously, we, we speak to a lot of writers uh, through doing the, these webinars. And it's, it's relatively unusual for a writer to, to do another job as well as, as writing. And I'm interested, um, I suppose, in how how you compartmentalize, how, how you manage to produce a, a piece of art without being wholly immersed in it, and, and, and whether perhaps you had any advice for anybody who was wanting to write on a, on a sort of part-time basis, as it were. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, first of all, you should know that I am, uh, I'm not a machine, I'm human, and there were plenty of days when instead of writing, I slept uh, or read the paper, or looked out the window. So I'm, I'm disciplined, but I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a human piece of technology. Um, and what I did was, you know, I couldn't do the thing that, that, uh, that I would normally do and that many fiction writers would do, which is make little notes on a, on a um, sticky note and put it up in front of you. I couldn't really do that on the on the train, you know, the train seat in front of me. But I, I developed a system where I would kind of keep the, my my notes kind of in front of me as I, uh, you know, in the same file as I as I worked. Uh, and I, each time I stopped, and this is kind of a uh, a Hemingway, uh, an Ernest Hemingway trick apparently. Each time I stopped, I kind of knew. I stopped in a place where I knew what I would come back to, where I would come back. Uh, 
And it, um, it what happened was um, that in that genre, mystery, thriller, um, suspense, if you can be patient enough with yourself till you have an idea that is really compelling to you, that's an idea that you really feel like writing, you have a, it's the spark of an idea, you really want to see where it goes, you're really interested in the characters, then you are able to, you know, do something as, as like right on the train, where you think your attention will be so, so split and diverted, but it, but it's, if the thing you're writing is that interesting to you, uh, presumably, and hopefully it'll be compelling to an eventual audience, but, uh, but that's what I found was that uh, the ideas were compelling enough to me that I could remain immersed for, for two hours a day. I, I, from, from my perspective, I think the worry is the other way around, that uh, you know, this would seep into your, your, your day job and you, you, know, you wouldn't be able to get the plots out of your head while you were, while you were working. Well, it's, uh, I, you're absolutely right, Jonathan, that does happen. But of course, I welcome that happening. <laughs> and I, I, you know, my heart is, was, has always been in my, in my fiction. Mm -hmm. And if I'm sitting in a meeting uh, and presenting some uh, advertising storyboards and an idea occurs to me, uh, all the better, all the better that I'm, that I'm always thinking that in the back of my head is always my, you know, what I would call my real writing. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, we we um, we had the uh, the Israeli thriller writer Draw Mishani uh, with us uh, a, a year or so ago, and he was telling us how his thrillers are meticulously planned in 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 minute detail bef before he starts writing the book. So I wondered whether you came from that school or whether your books sort of. Uh, take on a life of their own once you once you begin writing them well there are certainly uh two schools of fiction writer uh and i am definitely in the second school uh where i um i begin with a premise that i really like that i find compelling and i just go and see where it takes me um now uh the problem the built-in problem with that way of approaching things is that you can find yourself a hundred pages in and you discover something that, oh my gosh, this will be much better. Why didn't I think of this before? And you end up having to go back and, and rework. Um, but uh, I like leaving room for what I call the happy accident. In other words, just by being immersed in the story, uh, by spending the time with the story, things occur to you that wouldn't have occurred to you or wouldn't have occurred to me anyway. Uh, as I outlined and plotted before I began. So I am definitely uh, a seat of the pants writer uh, for all, the, for all the, the good part of that and for the bad part of that. Now, tell, tell me about the, the kind of research um, that you needed to do to write this book. Um, it, it, it strikes me there are, uh, firstly, there's a lot of characters in the book. They've committed a lot of different crimes um it's set in a prison all all of these things probably needed looking at finding out about t t tell us a little bit about how you how you did that and, and what what you did yeah and i'm i'm um you know i i'm a fiction writer and i'm very aware uh of being a fiction writer so i am only looking to do enough research to make uh to make the setting, to make the characters, uh, and to make the plot believable to a reader. Um, so really for me, uh, I didn't visit the prison. I made a decision not to. Um, I really, I did the online research that I needed to. Um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, there's a world of difference in research now from when I began writing novels in the, you know, in the late nineties. You really can you really can find just about everything you need um, in words and imagery uh, with with uh, internet research. Um, and again, I want it to be uh, I want it to feel like the truth. Uh, I want it to feel believable, 
beyond that, I'm not so concerned with with uh, getting the details right. So did you did you actually visit the prison? I actually did not visit the prison, and and uh, and kind of you know I was kind of on the fence about it. Um, I just didn't think that um, you know I thought that my uh, the way I pictured the day room uh, with one television uh, in one corner tuned to Fox and the other television in the other corner tuned to MSNBC. I didn't want to find out that in reality there's just one TV. I wanted I wanted my day room. Uh, I wanted my uh, kind of physical setup. So, you know, I kind of went with, with my version of Otisville mm. rather than the real one. We've had a question from uh, Charles Harris. He's a, he's a British writer uh, in Hampstead. Um, and uh, he, he makes an observation that agents and publishers tend to hate writers that change genre. And he asks, did you get much uh, pushback when you pitched uh, this uh, it's it's a uh, I mean Charles makes a great point uh, and in fact uh, by way of answer I mean he's absolutely right agents and publishers do hate that and to his point my agent made very clear John we do not want you leaving your lane uh, you know this is where your audience is this is where we want you to stay and in point of fact uh, I wrote this book and I had a great time with it and instead of going to the traditional uh, New York publishers who have published my books previously, I said, you know, I'm probably not gonna get any attraction there. Uh, my agent, if she submits it, is gonna do so very reluctantly. I'm gonna look for uh, a publisher wherever I can find one uh, that might be interested in this book. Uh, and indeed, uh, it's an English publisher, uh, Lightning Books, uh, and that's who I found. And I read about a kind of a, uh, a post-Trump comic novel that they had published. Uh, very, you know, and, and in the same situation where the writer had kind of bypassed American publishers or had tried American publishers and hadn't gotten anywhere. I went straight to Lightning Books. Uh, and I, they, they were judging the book just in and of itself. Not, they didn't know anything about my publishing history. Uh, so Charles is exactly right, um, and it's for that reason that I just I went to, I went with this you know a boutique English publisher, and I have to say it's been a wonderful experience because they're just they bought the book and are interested in the book because they're having fun with it the same way I am. He uh, he loved it too, and he's going to review it for his literary blog. So hopefully that will that would be uh, uh, we'll find uh, you some more readers. Charles Harris, thank you very much. That's that's really great to hear, and I'll be I'll be looking out for that. Now there is uh, a quote uh, in the book, um, apparently from Alfred Dreyfus, uh, eighteen ninety six. It says a prison is a world unto itself, with its own rules and culture, which can be neither ascertained nor understood except by experience. Now, is, is, this, a genuine, is this a genuine quote? Uh, in the spirit of the fraudsters uh, and scammers uh, in my book, it is not a genuine quote. <laughs> but to your earlier question, Jonathan, I, I fully intended to sound like a, a, an authentic quote. And I think that, uh, you know, Alfred Dreyfus and his experience on Devil's Island I think it, it sounds quite reasonable. Um, I, I think you're right. Um, uh, it, it's, it is very convincing. Um, but I suppose the question, you know, to throw back at you is, uh, if, if it can neither be ascertained or understood except by experience, how do you as a writer ascertain or understand it? It's, it's a, I, I, I like how you threw that back at me, Jonathan. I mean, I, you know, I do my, I, I'm creating characters. Uh, I'm creating my own prison. Uh, and um, it's, it's my character's understanding of, of their experience that, that really matters. Um, you know, that, uh, that made up quote is really to understand the filter uh, of made up characters. So let's talk about these characters because there are a lot of them. Are, are any of these based on real criminals or, or, or are they all uh, sort of invented? 
So uh, they are all invented. All the crimes are invented. All the names are invented. Uh, but I would point out to, uh, to your audience that that invention is coming out of an experience that we all have had, which is reading the paper uh, and seeing news articles about these kinds of crimes all the time. And it was, it was, not, uh, it was not any kind of you know, inventive or cognitive leap for me to come up with these crimes and come up with these little, uh, the little backstories of these criminals. Uh, because we, as you know, we, they're kind of part of our um, consciousness that the, you know, this kind of criminal, this kind of crime, uh, we, you know, it's, it's recurring. And, and um, so it was quite easy to come up with. And I figured that all these crimes would reverberate with, oh, yes, I read about this kind of thing. Oh, yes, I've, I remember reading about just this kind of thing. So one of these uh, inmates, uh, Simon Adler, he, he's the son of a Holocaust survivor. The chapter is called Auschwitz. I think you're going to read us a little, a little bit of that. A little bit yeah, of that it's it's um, uh, the chapter is called Auschwitz, and um, and it's just the the kind of um, the setup of the chapter, just the opening few sentences, really kind of uh, set up what the uh, tension and friction will be between uh, Simon Nadler, who uh, turned out to be a major character in the book, uh, Simon Nadler and his father, uh, who comes to visit him at Otisville. And each chapter uh, begins with um, the statement of the name of the character and uh, a little parenthetical note about the crime that they're in for. So the chapter begins Parenthetically, Simon Nadler, bank fraud, five years. Fictitious loan applications, $14 million in approved loans. Simon Nadler arrived at Otisville, like most of his fellow prisoners, escorted by several US marshals in their sharp gray uniforms. Herman Nadler arrived at Auschwitz, like most of his fellow prisoners, escorted by men in sharp gray uniforms too. Herman Nadler, Simon's father. Simon had looked out at the black suburban's big second row window at the Hudson River glistening in the sun, the city and dense suburbs gradually giving way to rolling hills and thick woods as the SUV made its way up the West Side Highway, up the Taconic, up Route 87. Herman, of course, did not look out. The car he rode in had only a couple of small high vent windows providing minimal air circulation for the livestock that was normally the cargo, but it was not very effective air circulation as those around Herman were frantically attesting. His view was of the Hieronymus Bosch and Edvard Munch faces pressed close to his in the hot airless dark. Simon Nadler had been arrested in the morning at his place of business, his suite on West 45th Street after the authorities had not found him at home. Herman Nadler too was arrested at his place of business, a well-known successful Viennese fur store, arrested at his desk after he too was not found at home. He quickly discovered that his family had been rounded up just hours before him, his wife, his daughter, his three sons. He was the last, the full set. So those are the, um, those are the kind of um, uh, the parallels in the arrest of Simon Nadler and the arrest of his father. And of course, their, their, their lives diverge extremely uh, in their prison experiences. And Herman Nadler uh, survives his um, and at the end of his life is confronted with uh, having a son who's been arrested and uh, sentenced to uh, prison. And, and in this juxtaposition of the two experiences, is, is there something you're something particular you're trying to say, or is it is it is it just that, that it, it's an interesting uh, exercise to compare the two? Well, it's it's a um, uh, it, you know reading the chapter, you see that it is it's really about Simon, mm. and it's about his guilt that this is where his life has ended up. 
uh, after the, you know, after his father's experience. And, uh, you know, as the son of a survivor, um, his father has always occupied a kind of a, a place where there's, it's a holy place in a way, it's a sacred place. Uh, there's no, there can't be certain kinds of discussions between, between father and son, can't really occur. Uh, you know, he's a special kind of person, a survivor is. And, uh, and Simon, his whole life has wrestled with this uh, relationship uh, and with his guilt um, and with his feelings of not measuring up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Do you think being the son of a survivor helps him get through the, the prison, the experience of being in prison? Um, I, in a funny way, it, it does, because he, uh, as the book progresses, there is a, a similar, um, a kind of a, um, I don't know, I mean, it's a terrible way to put it, but it would, but it at least is at least somewhat descriptive. There's kind of an Auschwitz light experience that takes place at, uh, at Otisville. Uh, it's a very, it's a kind of a, um, a pale uh, distorted mirror of what happened at Auschwitz. Uh, and because of that, Simon oddly is able to navigate it. Um, and it's, you know, it's to see what I'm talking about. Uh, you'll have to, you'd have to read the book. You will have to read the book. Um, one of the, I, I suppose, less, less plausible or less believable characters is, is, the, is the bigger mist. And um, the suggestion... A, a trigamist, a trigamist, Alan. Trigamist, yes, absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, uh, to be married to three women simultaneously does sound uh, somewhat impossible, although probably not strictly against Jewish law. Uh, <laughs> Is, is, that, is that based on anything anything in, in real life? Uh, it is based on cases, uh, you know, that I've read about over the years where where indeed somebody is married to, in the cases I read about, two women. Mm. Uh, I also had um, recently seen um, a documentary about Louis Kahn, uh, the famous uh, modern architect. Uh, and he was having, uh, simultaneously having relationships with three women and had three uh, families by those three women. None of the women and none of the families knew about each other. Uh, he was not technically married to any of them except one. Mm. Uh, but um, I tried to uh, set up the, uh, the trigamist's uh, story. Um, Adler is his name, right? Yeah, that's Adler. Mm. Uh, I tried to set up Adler's story and he tells his own story in a way that you'd say as a reader, Hey, I could see how he actually pulled this off, mm -hmm. uh, and you could see how he eventually got caught. Now let's talk about the the rabbi. Do, do they have a rabbi at Otisville? Is, is is there really somebody who's been incarcerated who sort of leads leads the flock? Y yes, and I'm glad you bring that up because that was one of the most alluring details for me uh, in the New York Times article: uh, the fact that. There are a number of rabbis uh, who have been sentenced for white collar crimes of one sort or another. Uh, and, um, you know, this book has uh, kind of a good rabbi and a bad rabbi, and both are incarcerated for, for crimes of one sort or another. Uh, but uh, I love the idea that, that uh, the good rabbi um, kind of discovers the flock that he always wanted they're in prison. It's, it's interesting, and it's also very interesting um, the way you explore the conversations between the inmates and, 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 and the rabbi, particularly around the character of Jacob and how um, some of the prisoners perhaps feel a, a, an affinity with him uh, stealing the birthright from, from, his, from his, twin, his twin brother. Right. right. <laughs> And just yeah, to say I, to it, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, about those conversations, I mean, the experience that I had, you know, you always, people, you know, you read about writers who say that at a certain point, their characters, uh, you know, just take off and take over. Um, the experience that I had was that um, 
once the minion was set up, once I knew who was sitting in the minion, and once I knew what the topic of conversation would be, as you say, the story of Jacob and Esau, or the story of the Ten Commandments, once I knew what the what the premise was, uh, as the as the discussion was taking place in the, you know, the fold ten ten folding chairs in a circle, uh, as a writer, I found I was literally just getting out of the way. Let me just stand aside. Let me just see what everybody says. Let me just put quotation marks around everybody, what everyone says, and let me listen and, and see what they say. That was literally kind of the experience, uh, you know, as the as the uh, the minyanim discuss uh, discuss all kinds of topics. The uh, um, you know the seven uh, uh, the seven ways into heaven, uh, the Ten Commandments, Jacob and Esau, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the prisoners enroll in this in this poetry class. Now, I, I wondered as a as a writer if there was maybe some wishful thinking here, whether you know maybe you would. <laughs> this is the kind of thing you would like to go and do, um, encourage uh, people to write poetry. Um, it, it's also very interesting um, because you are writing poems from this, the perspective of several different authors. Um, did, did you write poetry on your own account? Are you a poet as well as a, as a writer? Uh, I'm really not. I'm not a poet. Uh, I, uh, I know, of course, that, um, as we all do, that kind of in, in, in prisons, in the prison system, kind of self-improvement is a big part of what's, uh, uh, what happens there. Um, you know, uh, um, college degrees, high school equivalency degrees, um, uh, all kinds of, um, you know, uh, could be yoga, and, uh, and of course, writing classes and are, are a big part of, of um, uh, prison life. And, and I wanted some twist on that, because I could see that that could really give the book some energy. And when I struck on the idea of a poetry class, I said, Oh, my gosh, and I can have the poems of each of each inmate. And as you notice, you know, the poetry teacher is using the assignment to, you know, as a means to have you ref have each prisoner reflect on his crime. And the prisoner's poems really come come up far short of, of the kind of reflection that she's hoping for. Uh, but the poems were a lot of fun for me to write. Uh, and they they were a way to kind of generate, a, you know, further, somewhere further for the book to go. So, so tell me about this, how, how you approach writing a poem, which is, which is by a, written by a character you've, you've created. So there's, there's two degrees of separation between you and the poem. And, and obviously you have to create several different poems for several different people. Was that, was that something, uh, was that an interesting process? Was it a difficult process? Uh, it, was a, it was a fun process. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very similar to uh, setting up the minion discussions and just getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, you know, okay, the assignment, the poetry assignment is for this prisoner to write about his crime. Uh, let me just look over his shoulder in his class and see what he writes. And if you notice, uh, the poems are overwhelmingly rhyming couplets. Mm -hmm. And that's because that's these prisoners conception of what a poem is. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's a poem, it, it must rhyme, poems have to rhyme. Uh, and in fact, if you notice, there's, a one, there's one point where the poetry teacher reflects on, notices and reflects on the fact that these guys, the only kind of poem they really know about is a poem that is kind of a has rhyming couplets. It's kind of a nursery rhyme, uh, so there. So that kind of made it easy too. Mm. So we have a couple of questions come in about the prison. Uh, Jan Levy says, uh, "Is it an all male prison?" Um, and uh, Irene uh, Glausitz, I hope I've pronounced the name correctly. Irene, uh, were some of your imaginary prisoners from? If so, did they pray with with Talison to fill in? Uh, I, well, first of all, to the first question, it is an all-male prison. Uh, in the uh, American federal prison system, all the prisons are 
either male or female. Uh, and there are, you know, not surprisingly, there's, you know, it's a vast, it's an embarrassingly vast system, the American federal system. Uh, I think we have more, uh, we have a greater percentage of our uh, population incarcerated than any other country in the world. Very, very shameful, a whole, a whole side discussion there. Uh, and my prisoners um, were, um, I was imagining that they are, you know, in, in America, what we call their reform, uh, maybe conservative, maybe yarmulkes and kippahs, but, but um, uh, you know, the, the uh, one of the rabbis is, as we say in America, is Orthodox. Um, uh, and he's the rabbi who has the big, uh, when his family visits, he has all 16 of his children come and sit around him and he tells them Bible stories that he, that he twists <laughs> out of context. Uh, but the, um, but the kind of hero, uh, good rabbi is a, is a reform rabbi from a congregation in, in New Jersey. Um, I will, I will tell you one kind of interesting little detail about the, about the cover art. The original cover art of the book, uh, was, um, uh, orthodox, um, prisoners. It was, it was the same, it was the same, uh, silhouettes, but orthodox prisoners with their, you know, with with um, uh, with hats, and I said, you know, that's not really uh, that's not really who these prisoners are. Let's make them uh, let's make some colorful yarmulkes on a few of them. Uh, that's really more reflects what that prison population is. That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, actually, our talk last week was about how. Jews are portrayed in the press in Britain, and inevitably, it's with a black hat. Um, so, uh, well, and as that's very off to you for, for, for challenging that. It's, well, it's, and it's very, it's interesting because that, of course, that was the instinct mm -hmm. of the art director and the graphics department at the publisher. That was, you know, kind of without even uh, that kind of confirms what you're saying, Jonathan. That that was kind of their instinct about it, and uh, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not really who this is. I've been asked to hold up the book. There's the book. Hopefully, you can see the uh, the coloured uh, yamulkas on the uh, on the prisoners' head, the prisoners' heads there. there we go. I can I can I can do the same from uh, from this side of the pond. Okay. <laughs> um, I think this is a slightly tongue in cheek question from Stuart Goodman. I wonder. Did the Jewish prisoners ask for the prison gates to be opened during the Pesach Seder to welcome uh, Elijah in? Stuart, I wish I had thought of that. What a wonderful little detail. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, keep pause off to you. Yarmul goes off to you because <laughs> that's just a that's a great little detail. Wish I had done it. Now, um, obviously, anybody else has a question, please get it in the in the Q&A soon, because uh, we we don't have a huge amount of time left. Um, we, we come to what you might call the thriller element of the book, and I think it, it, it somewhat catches you uh, a bit by surprise as a reader. But this is your genre. This is your uh, this is your skill. Um, is this something that you you do consciously in terms of changing the the speed at which the book is moving as it as it were certainly in the case of this book it was it was a conscious choice in other words you know really the book for uh uh for better or worse structurally the first half is really the introduction of the characters it's the uh it's kind of the i hope interesting conversation that takes place in the minion the kind of philosophical discussions etc and then, if you notice, part two literally begins with uh, uh, the the suspension of some of the privileges that the prisoners have come to enjoy, and they're wondering why these uh, privileges have suddenly been suspended. And it's a little by little, little mm -hmm. by little, uh, their privileges are taken away, which leads them to ask why, what's happening, uh, is this coming from somewhere? Uh, way above us, which of course it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of is the impetus for all the, mm -hmm. the, the action. 
uh, of the second half. And you're exactly right. It is, mm -hmm. the pace picks up considerably. There are twists, there are, there's physical action, mm -hmm. there's confrontation, there's uh, uh, identity shifts. Uh, it's a lot of the tropes of, of, mm -hmm. of thriller writing are indeed in the back half. And I hope that they're done in a way that's fun, that mm -hmm. engages the reader, and that makes you want to keep turning pages. And, and spoiler alert, it's not completely a male prison for a short space of time. So <laughs> people will have to read the book uh, okay. to, to find out. Um, tell me, I, I've, not, I've not had the pleasure of reading your, your earlier works, but is this the first time you've explored uh, Jewish themes in, in, in a novel? Um, it's, um, it, it's actually the second time. Mm -hmm. uh, the the first book that explored these themes was a book called Moving Day, mm. uh, and Moving Day actually um, sold very well, and it's set up as a film at Lionsgate. Uh, you know whether it's ever made is that's a that's another thing entirely. Uh, but Moving Day uh, explored Jewish themes as well. Uh, it was a um, uh, it's an American industrialist who has all his uh, worldly goods taken from him in a, in a moving day scam. Uh, but it turns out that he uh, is a, um, a Holocaust survivor and his survival of the Holocaust gives him uh, a certain toughness, uh, a certain wiliness, and he is going to get his worldly goods back. He's not gonna be taken by this scam. And that's kind of in, in 10 seconds, the setup, but it did have a, uh, you know, a Jewish protagonist who was indeed a, a survivor. Mm. And talking of film, has, has this one been optioned for film? Do you, do you think it might be? I think it would make an amazing film. I am very pleased to tell you and, uh, and whoever is watching that um, a couple of weeks ago, Sony Television uh, reached out and optioned it to do a, a series. Amazing. A a streaming series. What they're envisioning is what's called a, a series of one-hour uh, dramedy episodes. Dramedy is the is the uh, term of art for something that is both uh, dramatic and comic. Uh, and uh, they're envisioning a you know a limited series of one-hour episodes. And again, I'm I'm enormously flattered that they reached out and they they are excited about the book. You know, whether anything actually happens, we shall see. So of all these uh, works you've had options, no, no, nothing so far has actually appeared in the in, in, in the cinema. That's correct. And a couple of things have been close, but yeah. uh, but nothing made yet. Nothing made yet. Well, hopefully, hopefully uh, soon. I have to say people are fascinated with this prison you've created. Uh, we have Yvonne uh, Cheney. She is our one of our regular viewers in Southern California. And uh, Yvonne says, does each prisoner have a designated time to serve? And Selma Avot, um, is this part of a larger prison? Uh, and which president allowed a Jewish section with more expensive kosher food? Uh, so uh, uh, to the first question, uh, yes, and um, and when when and if you read the book, you'll see that when each prisoner is named initially named, right after their name comes their uh, the technical crime they're in for and how long their sentence is, and it's a kind of a fun device because it lets you it tells you right away how serious the crime was. Uh, those with a longer sentence clearly there there was you know, greater, greater violation to uh, civil society. Um, so that's the first thing. And now the, in answer to the second question, it is indeed uh, part of a larger prison. Um, uh, Otisville, the minimum security camp that I write about has about 200, 250 prisoners uh, and they are free to move around the grounds. It is, um, it's kind of the, sister prison of a medium security, much more serious prison uh, that it's it, that it shares um, land with, it shares, it shares uh, space with in Otisville, New York. Now there's a review on the back of the book uh, from Nora Gold and um, 
it says here that the book raises some serious issues, the, the true cost of a life of crime, the meaning of loyalty, anti-Semitism, morality, and the power of poetry. Um, these are big themes. Uh, did, did, you, did you intend the book to have a, a serious message or is, or is this something that uh, is being bestowed on it by, by others? No, I, I, I did indeed uh, mean it to have a, a serious message. And I think uh, Dr. Gold is, is picking up on, on what those themes are. Uh, yeah, it's, it's um, to me, uh, part of Judaism is, an important part of Judaism is self-reflection, is self-understanding, self-reflection, uh, and in my mind, um, one of the things I like about my own Jewishness is uh, that, that we hold ourselves to a higher standard or should hold ourselves to a higher standard of self-reflection, um, of, of an attempt at self-understanding. So to me, that was part of the fascination of the prison. It was a little bit of, wait a second, I know that most of these guys knew better. I know that most of these guys knew they were doing the wrong thing. They, may, they had their reasons for doing the wrong thing. They may have felt that this was just a, a, a little moment and that they would be able to get out of it. Uh, and of course, these themes come up quite a bit in the book as you, as you go deeper and deeper into each character. Um, but I felt that uh, uh, these themes are there and I want readers to think about those themes and re reflect on them. Did, did you always have ambitions to be a, a writer? Uh, I think yes. I, I started writing fiction in, in high school and, and, uh, and really never, never stopped. And like all fiction writers, I've had uh, periods of, you know, of greater success, periods of lesser success, periods when I've, when I've been completely forgotten, uh, and then something kind of, something catches and brings me back. So it's been, you know, ups and downs, but the, for me, uh, the, the satisfactions of writing fiction far outweigh anything that happens in the marketplace. And what do you think drives you to uh, want to continue writing? Uh, I like the I like the fictional world that I find myself in. Once once I have an idea that is uh, that's motivating, that's compelling to me, mm -hmm. uh, I and it's a world. I mean, again, I'm I'm occupying that fictional world for two hours a day two and a half hours a day, you know, at which point I'm tired and I go ride a bike or play some golf or play some tennis or, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, again, I'm human uh, and I have, I, only, I have only a human capacity for writing fiction. So, but so it, that's still your pattern. You're still writing the same sort of amount of time, even though you're not, you're not now commuting to the, to that's the, exactly right. The that's, yep, that's exactly right. I and and if I'm in the flow, I think like any artist, if, if I'm in the flow, I find myself sitting there for hours and, and being completely unaware of what time it is. But if it's not flowing, uh, I have the luxury of being able to get up and and leave and come back another day. So, are you working on something else at the moment? What what's next? What's next? I, uh, I am indeed. I've I've uh, just finished a manuscript, which is with my agent now. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what she thinks. Um, but uh, yeah, I just I just finished a new novel. Uh, and again, it's a uh, it's a little bit more in the vein in the comic vein. It mm -hmm. has uh, you know kind of some thriller conventions and thriller tropes, but it's very much more in the in kind of a, a comic vein, which, which seems to, which feels right to me. It feels right for the kind of writer I am. Well, good luck with that. And uh, hopefully you'll come back and tell us about it when, when it's published. I, I, I yeah, would be sure absolutely sure. delighted to. It will be soon. So Jonathan, thank you. Thank you so much for being our guest uh, this evening. If you want to buy a copy of this book, uh, it's highly recommended. 
Um, there's a link on our website and also on the email, the follow-up email you'll get tomorrow. Uh, if you click that link, uh, the book costs you the same, but Millim earns a few pennies, so you help us with our costs of uh, staging all of these events. And to say thank you to you, this is some of my photography. This is Mug and David Adom, the Israeli Ambulance Service, in action, uh, saving lives. So we'll get that uh, in the post to you. Might That's wonderful. Little, thank might, you. I love it. I pleasure. Love might it. take a little while to get to you, but it's definitely uh, going to be on, on the way. Now, just a few words about our upcoming programme uh, before we leave you. Next Monday, the 30th of May, we have the author and Ajax archivist, Martin Sugarman, He's telling us about the march of the Jewish Legion through London in February of 1918. And then our June programme continues with the Holocaust survivor uh, Agnes Kaposi and musician and producer Ben Sidran. We have a, an action-packed few weeks uh, up and coming, so please visit our website at millim.org.uk to book your tickets. Make sure you sign up to our newsletter and then you won't miss anything. All of our events are free, but you can make a small donation. There's a link in the chat now to help us with the cost of putting on these events. Um, it remains for me to thank our, our guest, Jonathan Stone, once again. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you very much. The questions were wonderful. Uh, it was it was great to uh, to meet you. Really, my my pleasure, and I look forward to coming back. We will uh, we will look forward to that too. And in, until then, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing our audience as a future event. Until then, stay safe. See you soon.